November 7th. Oh, November 7th. Next Sunday. Next Sunday. Our thought for the week, life without God is like an unsharpened pencil. It has no point. These are the announcements. Please bear in mind in Jesus' name.
benefit to you in your life, whatever you may be going through, whatever you need. <clears throat> Preacher doesn't always know what it is that people need, but God knows. Amen. <clears throat> and so a lot of times the preacher opens the mouth of God and use that to bless the yeah. people in many yeah. ways. Yeah. I would say faith come by hearing. I'm hearing by the word of God. Yeah. Amen. So I pray that God using me as a vessel will be a blessing to those that need his word at this time, whatever it is that they may be need. Amen. 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 I was listening to uh, uh, to uh, Ella um, Simpson when you were talking about going to Washington. I remember uh, when they first opened up that place, the uh, Black Museum, I took my son and my grandson up there. They were young. And at that time, you used to have an appointment to go up there. Days in advance, and I didn't know that. And I went to see it, and I took them. When I got there, the lady at the door, she said, oh, Where's your appointment? I'm like, Well, we have an appointment. And she said, Well, we're not going to have an appointment to get in here. I said, Really? She said, Yeah. And she said, Are you taking those two boys in here to show them the history of what we've done? Well, there I am. She said, Come over here. Yeah. And it indeed was a treat. It had been a good scene. We went to Emmett Till's funeral. I think they touched him the most. You can walk over, look in the coffin. You can see um, the people who was there, the mother, her reaction. And it was very devastating. It was about the closest thing to being there. Amen. God is blessed. We've come a long way. Some of us have benefited from coming a long way. And some of us have gone backwards and made it worse. Amen. So we pray that those that don't know any better will learn. Amen. And then pull up and do what is right. And we go forward in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, we're here today because we have an opportunity to bring forth God's word. So without further ado, we're going to get right into that. Always being conscious of time. And want you to leave the benefits of what what we have to say, the more revelation you meditate and put it in your spirit and use it so that when the devil comes against you, you'll have something a little bit more than what you had to go off of. Amen. With that being said, those of you that have your Bible, we're going to be in the book of Luke, the seventh chapter. Um, the book of course is Luke, the seventh chapter. You can turn in there. Two of his disciples sent them to Jesus, saying, Are thou he that should come, or look we for another? Amen. When the men were come unto him, they said, John baptized has sent us unto thee, saying, Are thou he that should come, or look we for another? And in the same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind, he gave sight. Then Jesus answered, said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, mm -hmm. and the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached, and blessed is he that whosoever shall not be offended in me. And when the messenger of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John. Amen. He said, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? The reed shaken with the wind. But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment. Behold, they which are godly, are pearl, and live diligently, are in king's courts. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet, yea, I say unto you, 
and much more than his prophets. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the way before thee. For I say unto you, Among those that are born of woman, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Amen. 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 Thank you. See, uh, from the scriptures, we're going to use the thought from the um, the 18th verse, or the 19th, and the thought will be, "Are God He that should come, or look we for another? Mm. Are God He that should come, or look we for another?" Now, if you remember the story, you should remember that John was the one. They said, Behold, the Lamb of God was taken away the sin of the world. Yeah. It was John that presented Jesus first before anyone mm -hmm. uh, to a great degree. Uh, God had already showed him that whoever the dove sets upon when he baptized would be he. And that's, this took place when he baptized Jesus. So he knew he was the one. And he presented that to the world. But then John went through some stuff after he was captured. King Herod, and he was taken in. He was down in the dungeon, left alone, uh, waiting for uh, his judgment from King Herod. And he was away from his followers and everybody else. Mm -hmm. He had a lot of time to think about what he had done, where he had been, where he was going, and what was about to happen. Mm -hmm. and in the midst of all that, he really couldn't hear everything that was going on with Jesus since he was locked up. But he had visitors that would come every day and day, and he would always ask them questions about what is he doing? What's going on? What's happening? And so on this one occasion, he told his visitors, go ask him, you know, are thou he that should come? Or look we for another? And why did he ask that? Because, you know, troubles and trials have a way of making you rethink what you believe. Now I know that. Some folks ain't never really been through nothing, so if you believe in Jesus from the time you were born and you ain't never doubted, I'm sure. Mm. If you ever be sick enough to the point that seems like life is leaving your body, mm. you will question your faith. Come on, baby. Amen. I've been there. I felt life leaving my body, mm -hmm. and I wanted to make sure that what I was believing in was what I should be believing in. Because mm. I felt like I was on my way out of here. Mm. And once you close your eyes, I don't care what you believe. Reality will kick in when they open up again. Come on. And so John began to wonder, I wonder if he is really the one, or is there another? And then he told his followers, go, go ask Jesus. Mm -hmm. Ask him. Like, think about it. If he wasn't the one, how would he answer it? <laughs> mm -hmm. Only the one would know that. And so they went and asked Jesus. And, and Jesus, when they asked him, he just went on and kept doing his door and yelling and opening eyes. And, doing what he do. And then when he got through, he said, now go tell John what you saw. Tell him what's going on. And that was enough because he knew that when John heard that, John would know that this was one because the Bible already said that when Jesus come on the scene, the Messiah, when he come on the scene, that he would be healing the sick and opening up blinded eyes. He would be preaching to the poor. Yeah. The Bible already said that he would be doing these things. And Jesus was doing everything that the Messiah was supposed to do when he come on the scene. So John knew then that this indeed was the one. He was comfortable enough to know yeah. that whatever happened to me at this point, at least I know I've done my part right, mm -hmm. and this is the one. Yeah. And so if I lose my life, I would lose it knowing that I'm standing up for the right and the right thing. Right, that's right. And that's the way it's got to be. You have to know before you leave here that you're standing up for the right thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. I want to talk about the miracles of Jesus. Amen. Jesus done many miracles. And a lot of these miracles, believe it or not, could almost be explained away to some degree. Mm. Uh, and the best way I can explain it is that Jesus really didn't make it any easier for people not to explain it away because he was always private. It was sort of like in the beginning of his ministry, he started up uh, around about 29, 30 years old when he started his ministry as four days going about. And even then, he kept it very private. He didn't want people to really know who he was yet. And so oftentimes he would do stuff and he would always say, shh, don't tell nobody. Uh, don't, don't talk about this. Don't say anything. And you know, you get healed and, and 
set free, I mean, boy, keep that quiet. He walked in, man, let me tell you what he done for me. Because yeah. people were the same. But Jesus often tried to keep things quiet because he would always say his time was not his time. See, the Lord God works on a timetable. Mm-hmm. Everything has to be right on time. Because it works better when it's right on time. Mm-hmm. He knows when it's the best time. Sometimes you can do something too soon. You can say something too early. Amen. There are some things, even though it's true, you can't really say it. And if you do say it, you can't say it right away. You have to work on how to say it. Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, if somebody has something on their face, put up their nose or something, you don't want to say it in front of a crowd. They hit your nose. It's not a good time to say it. Pull it to the side. Excuse me. It may be a better time to say it like that. It'll come across a lot better. That's right. That's right. If somebody looks bad, you're looking rough. You don't want to tell them that you just ugly or you're rough. You look bad. You don't want to just throw it out like that. You might want to start off by, you know, why don't you, you know, do this and be like that thing? You get a little, you know, it comes across a little better. Mm-hmm. You got to learn your timing of when you talk to someone. Yeah. You yeah. just can't throw stuff out there. And so Jesus' time wasn't it. One of the first miracles Jesus had done that we are aware of was uh, turning water into wine. Now, Jesus and his disciples was invited to a wedding. And they went to this wedding, and they were having a good time. They usually have a good time at the wedding. Uh, it was a great thing. Uh, two lovers getting together for the first time. They were excited. They were drinking wine and having a good time. And Jesus was there. He was the disciple. They were having a good time. But in any case, it's not wrong with having a good time. I, I, I know some of y'all are so saved and you just get miserable trying to make it to heaven because you don't do nothing. Mm. You're just trying to be perfectly holy, holy, holy. But you got to learn to have fun and enjoy life while you're here. Mm. And his disciples was having fun and enjoying life. Amen. And in the midst of that, they had ran out of wine. Now, this was kind of somewhat embarrassing to run out of wine on such occasion as this. They would be sort of embarrassed that we have a good time and y'all didn't have enough of all the people. Now, I don't know if they had enough of people that more people came than what they were expecting. I don't know what happened, but they ran out. And Mary came to Jesus and said, uh, Jesus, they, they, they ran out of wine. And Jesus thought, I'll say, woman, what is that to me? My time is not yet come. First of all, let me start off by the fact that Jesus called her woman. That was really not a disrespectful saying. Actually, to call a woman woman then, at that time, was more of respect. It was sort of like ma'am or missus, you know, it's sort of a sign of respect. And so to call her woman was actually respectful, even though it was his mother. Now, why did Mary come to Jesus anyway? Well, my understanding is Joseph was gone at this time. He had no doubt died and was gone off the scene. And so Jesus was not being married or anything. It automatically made him the man of the house. And it was normal for Mary to come to him at a time that she had to come to the man of the house. For anything, she would come to Jesus. He was the oldest child, and he looked out for his mom. So she just came to him because that's what she normally do. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming she wasn't looking for him to do a miracle. Because remember, he hadn't really done miracles at this point anyway, so it's not as though he do them all the time. Amen. So but she just came at the fact that he was, the, you know, the head of her house. And, said, and told him the problem that, he, that, that, was, that was going on. Because she knew Jesus. She knew that Jesus would see a problem and wouldn't want to fix it because that's just the way he was. He would hate to see something going on and, and he not do anything about it. But Jesus started off by a woman, which is respectful, believe it or not. And then he said, what is that to me? Which pretty much means that this is not my house. I'm not the head of this house. You might want to go to the head of this house and tell him about the problem. Mm-hmm. Amen. So that's the point of what is that to me? But then he goes on anyway and said, my time has not yet come, which means that it's not time for me to do something that will bring a lot of attention on me. Mm-hmm. See, if I turn this water to wine, everybody see it, everybody will be like, oh, who is he? Mm-hmm. And it wasn't time for that because then if he do it too quickly, too soon, then others would jump on him and try to crush him quicker than then he was ready for this to happen. He already knew that they were going to attack him anyway, but he didn't want them to attack him right away. He had other things he had to do before that time came. And so he didn't want to tell them that. But anyway, he saw the problem and he decided to solve it. But even that, he tried to do it privately. Yeah. 
He only took a few people and said, come on in, you need one pot to put them right here. He said a few prayers, boom, wine was there. Matter of fact, the wine was the best they ever had. Amen. Too bad that's not on the shelf. I can imagine that. Wine that Jesus touched. You know it had to be good. And it was so good that the people said, most of the time they bring out the good stuff and then throw some stuff out of it. But this, this people that set the best for last. Yeah. But many were so drunk and having a good time anyway, they didn't even know a miracle that had even taken place. Mm. They just thought it was some extra wine that they found from the back. Only a few people knew about this miracle. <laughs> Amen. So therefore, this miracle almost could be explained away by some skeptics that would say, well, maybe uh, Jesus and his disciples uh, had some extra wine anyway out there on the view and they brought it in. And, and maybe it really wasn't a miracle. They maybe just some extra wine that they brought in. It could be explained away. But in reality, it was a miracle. Yeah. Because it was water and Jesus turned it into wine. One of the next miracles Jesus did was when he healed a deaf uh, mute of the populace. And this is found in the book of Mark 7 31. I'm going to turn to Mark 7 31. And you're not going to stand on this one. And it says, and again, they parted from the coast of Tara, of Sidon. He came into the Sea of Galilee through the midst of the coast of Depopolis, and they bring unto him one that was deaf and had an instrument in his speech. And they beseeched him to put his hands upon him. And he took him aside from the multitude and put his finger in his ear and spit and touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, amen, and said unto him, uh, Bill. Amen. So this man, well, he could not hear and he could not speak. Mm. And we see people like that. You know, some folks you see they can't speak and they can't hear. But a lot of times we see a person like that, it looks like maybe they may be slow or like they're not learned because they can't speak and they can't hear. The way they carry themselves, it looks like that they are unlearned. Mm. Uh, I actually have a relative in my family who was actually about the smartest one in the family. <laughs> But you would never know it because they couldn't hear that well. And it seemed like they had a problem. If you throw some books and stuff in front of them and, and read or spell anything, they would be on top of everybody. Because they were always gifted. But they appeared to be that they were slow. And I can imagine this man appeared to be slow and unlearned and didn't know anything because of his situation. Mm. But anyway, Jesus came with no problem. And he put his finger in his ear. And then spit and touch his tongue. Now, I don't know if I can just let a stranger just come through and spit on my tongue. But, if you got a problem, I guess it really don't matter. Whatever works right. at that point. Yeah. And so yeah. the man trusted Jesus. Yeah. And in the midst of that, he was healed. But one of the things that would happen was Jesus kind of pulled him to the side. Again, he was trying to be private about this thing. It wasn't his time yet to expose to the world who he was. So again, this miracle could almost be explained away. Why? Because most people of that day sort of looked like each other's anyway. I mean, when they came to get Jesus, they needed Judas to kiss him because they couldn't tell which one was him. Because most people sort of looked alike. Even Jesus blend in with the people that walked with him. So it could either be explained away that this ain't the same man that was dealt with I mean, could this ain't the same man. This is another man that they're trying to use to make us think that he did something. So it could be explained away. But in reality, Jesus really did open up this man's ears and gave him the ability to speak plain. Mm -hmm. So Jesus' miracles are real, even though many could probably try to explain it away. We move down to the healing of a blind man all right, this blind man was born, was, uh, born blind, and his name was, he was born blind uh, from birth. His name was Barnabas. Uh, you find this in the book of Mark 10, 46. But you're still in the book of Mark. If you go to 1046, it says, And they came to Jericho, and he went out, of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Barnabas, the son of 
uh, tonight are set by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thy son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace, but he cried out uh, the more a great deal. Thy son of David, have mercy on me. Amen. We see here that at this point, Jesus is becoming well known. More so than when he was at this wedding. More so than any other time. At this point, crowds were coming around. They were wanting to be around him. They had seen his healing. His popularity started growing. He started getting bigger and bigger. And so this man, Barnabas, he heard about Jesus. The Bible said, faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So he heard about Jesus. And even though he was born blind, he couldn't see. He got somewhere where he could hear. And he was on the side of the road. And he could hear the crowd and hear the people. And when he heard that Jesus was getting close by, he began to cry out, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. Yeah. Amen. You see, he called him the son of David. This was a high position to be called the son of David. Mm -hmm. David was uh, Israel's greatest king known at that time, way back in the days. And, 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 and many, many people respected David, and they knew that the Messiah would come through the lineage of David one day. And so to be called the son of David was a great honor to give him. It was a sign that he must be the uh, Messiah. And so he cried out. And the people, because Jesus was always private, they didn't really want people to know a lot about who he was, what was going on. He would always, shh, be quiet, don't tell nobody. And so the disciples and the rest of them knew this too. So when they heard the man crying out, they was trying to shut him up too. And hey, man, what you said? You're going to draw a crowd, you're going to draw a whole lot of unnecessary stuff. Be quiet. But the more they tried to make him be quiet, the louder he got. He said, Now, son of David, have mercy on me. You see, when you got something going on, you got to call out to the Lord. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. Amen. If you got a need, call out to the Lord. Amen. And God will come to your rescue. Amen. This man had a need. Yeah. And his need was more important than trying to be private about it. He didn't really care who heard it. He just wanted, he like, I may not never get to hear this man again. I better get him while he's here. Yeah. And he cried out, and Jesus heard it. Got Jesus' attention. Uh -huh. How many know that you get Jesus' attention when you Hello. cry out? Sometimes Hello. you gotta cry above the crowd. Hello. Hello. You gotta holler above the crowd. Hello. You gotta make your voice known. Hello. And when you do so, the Lord will hear you. Yeah. See, some of us are just all quiet and don't want to, you know, the Lord, the Lord, help me, help me, help me. You got to Lord help me. Let him know you're there. Amen. Amen. And this man, the more they tried to make him quiet, the louder he got. Because he had a need. And when the Lord got to him, he said, what is it that you want me to do for you? Man, that's almost like a genie coming out of the bottle right there. You got one wish, what you want? Man, you could ask for money. You could ask for fame. You could ask for a whole lot of stuff. All he wanted was to be able to see. Amen. He said, I just want to receive my sight. Amen. I don't care if I don't get rich. I don't care if I don't become well known. I don't care. If I, I just want to be able to see. Be like it's all my life. I want to see what everybody else is seeing. Yeah. And the Lord said, Our faith has made the hope. Sometimes it is your faith that gets the job done. No, no. Amen. Now, it is the power of God that does it, but it's no. your faith that gets his power moving. Yeah. See, you got to have the faith to know who he is. Uh -uh. you got to no. recognize who God is. Yeah. See, God is more no. than just somebody who puts yeah. shoes on our feet. On. He's more than somebody who puts clothes on our back. On. He's more than somebody who just puts food in our mouth. He is the creator of all. Faith. Come on, yeah. 
But then again, it could have been explained away. Come on, bless it. Amen. It could have been explained away because everybody was trying to be private and everything would crowd around. And somebody could have said that maybe he really was in line. Maybe he was playing the game. You know, maybe he was one of Jesus. Because after that, he started following Jesus. Yeah. So somebody could say, well, he was with Jesus all the time. I know. You just use him to take advantage of people. Yeah. He's probably trying to collect some money or trying to get something out of us. You know, like many in the world that does today, all your things are given. But God wasn't about a gift. He was all about man really being a blessing to the people. Amen. And so therefore, it wasn't about, he just said, you know, I, you know, I Mary knew. Mary knew that he had a heart, that he saw something, he had to fix it. And that's why Mary asked him. That's why she went to him. She knew that if he see this, he's going to fix it. He, he just can't stand to see people hurt and going through. And, and knowing that he had the power to do something and not do nothing. Amen. And so he healed that man that day. That man followed Jesus from then on. Another healing Jesus did was the healing of a paralegic at uh, Bethesda. Now, what happened with that was there was a man, and I, instead of going to scripture, I just tell a story. So there was a man that was paralyzed. He couldn't really move. He just had to lay on his bench all the time. And because he couldn't move, he, he wasn't like on the bench. He couldn't go somewhere and wait to hear and then cry out. He couldn't do anything. He had to have somebody else to help him. So his friend grabbed his bed and took him. And, and, and when they got to Jesus, it was so crowded. And Jesus getting bigger and bigger. Man. He was getting bigger and bigger. Amen. Jesus still trying to be private. It ain't working. Everybody just don't know who he is. Yeah. Amen. He's still trying to be kind of discreet to a certain degree. Because it's our way he came. Mm -hmm. But people still, like, they were still giving the credit to who he was. Uh -huh. On the back of one case, he even asked, who can men say I am? Mm -hmm. Jesus. And then Peter spoke up that thou the Christ, the son of the living God. And so Jesus do it. This, this thing ain't much private anymore. Come up. A lot of people know who I am. Come up. Amen. Because of what he was doing. Thank you, Jesus. And so they brought this man in. They couldn't get in because of the crowd. Everybody was trying to get something from Jesus. Mm. A lot of folks were trying to get something really selfishness. Come on. You know, they were probably just trying to get, you know, whatever they can get out of him, food or something. And, you know, you always got folks who come to the church who always want something from the church because they think the church is the church. The church is supposed to help them. So you always got those folks who just want something. They think you're supposed to give something. So you got some folks who are coming to Jesus to get something just because they think he's supposed to give them something. Amen. But he was looking for folks that was in need Amen. and had faith to believe and trust him. Yeah, and so they couldn't get in. They went up to the roof. And it wasn't like, well, we got shingles and all this good stuff. Most people just had hay and straw and stuff. And you needed to bust that up. And they bust through the roof and brought the man down to Jesus. Amen. And Jesus saw the fact that even though the man couldn't help himself, he had friends that was willing to help. Sometimes we just got to help one another. Amen. Amen. Sometimes when somebody else can't do it for themselves, we got to step in and help somebody else. Amen. That's why it don't hurt you every day. And then I saw a man the other day walking down the street and he was walking alongside of the road and he was barely making it. I know we don't pick nobody up, but I'm by myself and I'm like, I'll take a chance to make it on the wall. I turned around and came back and said, you mind, man? And he said, no, I'm good. I said, no, I don't look like you're good. He said, but I am. I said, well, let me give you a ride anyway. He said, no, I'm fine. Go ahead on. So I wasn't able to help him because he didn't want me to help him. But it bothered me to see him going through that. Sometimes you just got to be touched and try to help somebody if you can. Amen. Don't just be selfish. You got a call. I understand I don't expect a, a lady to do this, you know, if you're going around to get up a man or something Amen. or anything. Amen. I understand you got to be discreet, but unless you live by it. But other than that, me, you know, his condition, the way he was acting, the way he carried himself and all that, you know, I kind of sized him up, felt like I had him if I needed to. You know, so I kind of went through that level with him. You know, he break out the so he's going to get hurt. But other than that, I try to help him. And that's what we got to do sometimes. You got to try to help somebody. Amen. If you can. Amen. Amen. Don't be selfish. Just God that bless you. Then you gotta walk around thinking, man, you know, this is all for you. You ain't gonna help nobody else. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Amen. But we see here that he was. But then again, amen, again, uh, it can almost be explained away. Uh, people can explain everything away. They can say that this man, when they put him on the bench, they all got together to plan this out and put him down and make it look like he couldn't walk and all this other stuff. And the people on the house are probably looking at y'all need to pay for this. Told my house up. They probably even looked at you, but you gonna pay for this. Now, whatever, but in any case, people could explain that away that maybe he really wasn't in his condition. Amen. That maybe this really wasn't a miracle. 
But it was. Everything that Jesus did was a miracle. Amen. Now, yes. the question is, what is yes. a miracle? Yes. A miracle is something that normally happens that can't normally happen, that don't normally happen because we, we have what you call um, the laws of, of nature, gravity. I'll give you a good example. Uh, I'm walking with the mic for a minute. If I was to walk right here, walk down the step, now when I step up right here, right, I can't stand on air. If I take my weight off of this leg, gravity automatically is going to bring that leg down. It's going to happen every time. Every time, gravity is going to bring my leg down. There's nothing I can do about it. But a miracle would be that I can step on air and walk without touching the floor. That would be a miracle. Right. Yeah. Amen. So a miracle is something that, that, that can happen when it goes against the laws of nature, the laws of everything. And so a lot, sometimes uh, Jesus had to do stuff that would go against nature or go against the laws of gravity, go against just ordinary stuff. Amen. He did it because there were some, some cases where, amen, the only way it can be done is to go beyond. See, for example, uh, if you get cancer, uh, and pretty bad cancer, uh, what they call the four stages or something, you pretty much is, it pretty much is going to take you out to a great degree. It's going to eat up the body and take you out. But God can step in and change all that. He can step in and take uh, those cells and make them all new and, 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 and do away with that cancer. But even the doctors can't do it. The doctors can they can, they can give you, uh, uh, you know, all kind of medicine and shots and, and they can take you and radiation or whatever they need to do. They can do all of that, but then when they do all that and it still don't work, then the doctors, only thing they can say, well, there's not all we can do. You know, and then send you somewhere and give you some medicine to gradually check on out of here. But God can still fix it even at that point. He can step in without any surgical tools or anything. Amen. Technically, he don't even have to touch you and heal you completely. That is a miracle. Amen. And many times he done that. He was healing people. Amen. And he was setting people free. Yeah. Now we see here there is another uh, miracle that Jesus did when he he healed a centurion servant. Now, the centurion is what? This was a Roman soldier, and he was in a high position. His position, he had a Roman uh, a centurion had about 80 to 100 men under him, and, and he was like, you know, they retired, we called supervisor. Supervisor over a whole group, and he tell them what to do. And so the centurion, was his job was to make sure that everybody did what they were supposed to do. And if they didn't, he would discipline them or whatever he had to do to make them do it right. And so, but this centurion, even though he was a Roman soldier, he had compassion, uh, amen, for the people of God. Mm. Uh, he had so much better compassion for them that he even helped them build synagogue on one occasion. Yeah. So uh, I heard one story that he was married to a Jewish girl. Uh, I don't know if that's the case or not, but in any case, he had love for the people of God. And because of this love he had for the people of God, one of his servants, amen, amen, which was uh, a Jew, was sick. And, uh, and, and no doubt his sickness was probably taking him out. And, and he heard about Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Even the Romans heard about Jesus at this point. And they said, he said, he sent some of his servants. He said, go find Jesus and bring him here. And, and I need him to heal my servant. Mm -hmm. So they go get Jesus and Jesus comes. And when he gets near, then the centurion let Jesus know. Now look, I know you custom. I know y'all don't like to be around us because... It, it, it defile you in such a way, so you ain't gotta come here to my place. All you gotta do is just send the word. Because yeah. I'm in authority. When I send the word, I know it's gonna it's gonna work. Because I'm in authority and it works. And so Look. when you're in authority, when you send the word, it's gonna work. Look. Jesus Amen. turned around and he looked Amen. and looked at his own people and said, you know what? I ain't seen nothing like this for y'all. Y'all don't even have this kind of thing. Look. This man have enough faith to believe that I ain't even got to come, but just send the word. Get up. How many know that God don't even have to do that? Get up. You can call on him and he can Get just up. send the word. Get up. Amen. And he said, you just send the word. Yeah, look. Look. And when 
and the, the people uh, went back to the man, his servant was healed. Thank because you. God sent the word. Thank you. you see here, you got to have faith no matter what. You got to trust God. They, even, especially if somebody who really don't serve God, uh, uh -huh. trust God. How in the world can you not trust God? I mean, even folks who don't really know God say their grace, yeah. say their prayers that night. When they're in trouble, they call on the Lord. Come Amen. On. Even the courts will tell you, put your hand on the Bible. Nobody in there believes the Lord every time. Put your hand on the Bible. Put your hand on the Bible. Put your hand on the Some things they used to have it in the courtroom, you know, uh, you know, in God we trust. But some things used to be taken damage. We're talking about the old that don't know the Lord. This is a jury trusted God. But again, it could have been explained away. Bless. Amen. You know how they got crooked cops now. You know, we got drug dealers out there doing all kinds of drugs and stuff. And then you wonder how the drug dealers get away with all this because you got crooked cops helping them. So it could have been explained away and said, well, you know, the centurion will work with Jesus. Jesus was probably paying on the side and all this other stuff and trying to, and the centurion was going to kind of help him look like he was somebody. See, one thing you got to understand about the times that Jesus lived in was there was a lot of people that came through acting like they was Christ. Uh -huh. All right? There was a lot of people coming through that, and they were doing everything they could to prove that they was Christ. Uh -huh. So when Jesus came on the same scene to a lot of people, he was just another guy trying to act like he was Christ. Uh -huh. I want you to think about that. Some people look at him like, yeah, there's another one. There's another one. So, but the difference between Jesus and some of these other folks was that look like every time Jesus do something work. People are being healed, set free, and delivered. People are coming out. Jesus casting out demons. People were possessed. And when Jesus got through with them, man, they was clean and they, they didn't act like that no more. So he was, people were like, this, this guy is different. There's something real about him. And folks don't believe it. But there were always the skeptics that were on the side trying to do away with it and come up with an excuse. So somebody could have said, well, you know, the centurion was working with him. And this man went in on his servant. This was all a gimmick to make Jesus look good. They're trying to get him in a position so he could be above the Pharisees and everybody else. See, the Pharisees were looking at the fact that if Jesus get bigger than them, guess what's going to happen to them? They're going to start losing money. Losing money. And see, they didn't want that. We don't care what y'all believe, how you believe, as long as the money's coming in. See, that's what we want. And Jesus is doing what he's doing. Folks gonna start following him and not us. And we're gonna start losing out. So they had to do away with Jesus. They had to. Because he was messing with them. We see here the next one we go to was feeding of the five thousand. Amen. Now, now, this miracle is almost hard to explain away. People are hungry. Amen. How in the world are you going to feed all these folks? Some folks can't feed their own family. Amen. You have a cookout. It's hard to feed everybody coming to the cookout. But he is feeding a whole multitude. And see, these people was there to hear him preach. And he was preaching and teaching and talking about the kingdom of God at the end. And he was talking about, you know, heaven. He was talking about hell. He was talking about the glory of God. He was talking about the Son of God. He was talking all about what is to come and what this was all about. And, and the folks were just listening and listening. And before you know it, was getting late. And they were hungry and they folks didn't have no food. But at that point, again, he defined the laws of practice, of the laws of nature. And he fed a whole multitude, the Bible said, with two fish and five loaves of bread. Amen. I know that somebody could come by and say, well, you know, well, you know, so most of his disciples were fishermen. So you know they had some fish. And what it was, they pulled out that fish them boys got, and they fed the crowd like that. But I'm here today to tell you that even the disciples, amen, didn't have that much fish. Not to feed a crowd like that. And if they did have a kind, you would see the fish somewhere. Amen. They took the baskets around and People were reaching in, grabbing and grabbing before you know it, fish was just coming out. Bread was there. This indeed was a miracle. But unfortunately, it could almost to a certain degree be explained away. Somebody could come in and try to explain it away. That maybe the disciples, amen, brought all this extra fish to be 
And then we come down to the woman with the issue of blood. The woman with the issue of blood, now, my understanding from the word issue, uh, in some cases in the Bible, uh, issue could be classified as uh, something that's hereditary, something that runs through your family. Uh, she had an issue, meaning that she had something that ran through her family. That means what she had, uh, many people in her family had the same thing. I mean, it was normal for her to get it because people in her family get to it. You know how some folks got some things that happened to them because it happened to other folks in their family. Amen. So she had something, amen, that was, yeah, unfortunately, it fell on her. It didn't fell on all the family members, but every day there's somebody in the family would get it. And she had it, and she had it for 12 long years. And then we see here that she had tried to go from doctor to doctor to doctor trying to get healed. And, and that's not wrong with that. If you got money, you use what you got. Amen. And money means nothing when you hurt it. Money means nothing if you're sick. Amen. You'll spend every dime. And she did. The Bible says that after she spent all her money, not only was she not better, then she was worse. I don't know if she was worse because they used her as a guinea pig or because in time her situation was only getting worse. But in any case, her situation was bad. But she heard about Jesus. Yeah. And again, the Bible says, they come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So she heard about Jesus, and when Jesus came in the area, and again, Jesus was well known at this time. He's still trying to be private, but I think it's a little too late for that. I mean, he, he's anything but private. But still, he's trying to keep it discreet as much as possible. Because what he actually come to do was to die for the world. And in order to die for the world, there's a certain time that it's going to be when he's going to die. And he wants that to happen on God's time, not on man's time. Right. So he had to be discreet until that time come. And we see here that this woman came to him. Now the woman couldn't be around nobody else because if she touched anybody else, they would defile too. So she covered herself up, she got in the press. Now I'm assuming that she didn't really touch nobody because she could have got in trouble just by touching people. She even made up her mind that she wasn't even going to touch Jesus. She said, I'm going to touch his garment. Yeah. I ain't going to touch his skin, his body. I'm going to just touch his garment. Because if I touch his body, and they see me touch his body, they going to get me for the power of Jesus. How no, no, no. I many know you can't defile Jesus? No. No. But we see here, she got in the press, and when she got close enough, she reached out, and she grabbed the heel of his garment. She thought that she could get what she wanted and go about her business. And only she would know. She did not know that Jesus would not know. No. But you can't steal a blessing from the Lord. No. Amen. You can probably take one, but you can't steal one. No. Not without him knowing about it. No. And so when she touched the hem of his garment, immediately she did. It was made whole. No. And Jesus turned around and said, Who touched me? Yeah. It's like they yeah. around like, Hey, why did he touch you? Yeah. Yeah. This crowd's all around. Everybody's touching you. Everybody's trying to get a, a piece of you. He said, no, somebody touched me with the, with, with the faith of healing. They touched me with faith. No. Amen. You can get it. Jesus can be doing something else. And you can call out to him in such a way that you can get his attention. Or whatever else he's doing, he'll stop it and deal with you. He'll stop whatever he's doing somewhere else and deal with you. Because you got that kind of faith. And we see here that when she touched me, meaning she just made whole. Turn around and, 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 and let everybody know who she was and told everybody what was going on. Now they came to the bank with her because she was here. Now, I'm sure she had to go before the priest to prove that what Jesus did was real. But then again, somebody could have said, well, you know, maybe her situation would already get better. She did go to a lot of doctors. Maybe one of those doctors actually really is what done it. We did give her a prescription several times. Maybe some of those prescriptions that we gave her prim primarily ended up working for her no, 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 no. and explained the way that she was healed by God. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And then we move on down to, amen, raising up the dead. Mm -hmm. Now, you know this is going to be a talk here. Yeah. The first one on was there was a little girl who was sick. The Jesus was asking, actually, amen, and he was dealing with the woman at the time. And he stopped that just to, just to help other one with these blood. And then the little girl was sick. And that's what he was on his way to deal with anyway. 
But by the time he got there, the people came out there and said, well, ain't any use in doing anything now. You go on and do something else. She's dead now. She's gone. And so Jesus, he took only a few of the disciples, Peter, James, and John. You see, and see, see this miracle he's about to do now is so big and so grand that everybody can be a part of this one. Amen. You know, because Seth, some people who would drain, amen, your faith. They would drain your faith. And God knows it. So people who would drain your faith need to get out of the way. Lord, I'm going to bring up the whole thing over here. Not even the rest of the disciples. Amen. Even the rest of the disciples wouldn't even at that level yet. But y'all three, y'all, y'all were some bad boys right there. Y'all come on. We, y'all, we're going to do something. So they go in and then the people say, well, she's dead already. Well, where y'all going? Jesus said, she, she, she just sleeping. People looked at, at Jesus, they were looking at each other. What's wrong with him? Where's he from? And they start scorning him. They start talking about it. This thing was crazy. Something wrong with it. Because, first of all, you don't raise nobody from the dead. How many times have you been to the funeral trying to raise up? How many times? I'm not going to pick about this, but I was at a funeral one time when the body didn't raise up. That's only because the funeral director did the wrong thing. <laughs> Half the place cleared out. Oh, it's happened up in New York, man. Have it clear it out. <laughs> so you see, everybody ain't ready for a miracle like that. They just ain't ready. They're not ready for somebody to raise up right before them. See, because we believe when you're dead, you're dead. Amen. I know y'all know about Richard Proud. Richard Proud said, I've been here all night and the man ain't moving from muscle. Dead folks don't move. They don't move. But Jesus goes in, amen, and raised this little girl up. And then when he breaks her out, the people see her down. The same one that they talk what's wrong with him, he must be crazy. Then he looked like, maybe we the ones crazy. But what did they do? Well, maybe she was in a coma. Maybe she was in a deep sleep. Maybe she really wasn't dead. Maybe she was just semi-unconscious for a little bit. And explain away. And Jesus went in there and, and if she came back to life or she just came, woke up from the coma she was in, they could explain it away. But no, he raised this girl up from the dead. The next person he raised up was in the tomb about four days. Now you're in the tomb, that's it, you're gone. Even if, even if they put you in the tomb and you're still alive, the tomb is going to kill you. The tomb itself is going to get you. First, they wrapped him up like a mummy. You see how mummy is? They had to wrap him up head to toe. Then they got him in a sheet. Then they got him in a tomb. That by itself would kill you. Four days. The Bible says his body was smelling. That means it started decaying. And he raised him up. Raised him up from the dead. But because he was a good friend of Jesus, he was such a good friend of Jesus. The Bible said when Jesus heard about it, he went. Yes. He cried. Yes. Yes. So somebody said, well, you know, they were real close anyway. They probably, when they put him in that tomb, he probably had a little section in the back where he was, had to stand for a few days waiting for Jesus to come and make this thing look good. You could explain it away. Uh-huh. But I'm here today to tell you, it wasn't something you could explain away. Jesus really did raise these people up from the dead. Lazarus was raised from the dead. We come on down to Jesus walking on the water. We're getting close to the end now. We come down to Jesus walking on the water. He told the disciples, he said, y'all go ahead on over and I'll get with y'all later. He said, I'm going to deal with the crowd. And then when I get through with them, I need to go do some praying. That was time Jesus had to get away and pray. He had to get away from everybody to pray. Sometimes you have to get away from everybody. You just got to get away. So he came and after he got through preaching, Disciples, they were tired, they would go out and get down, so they went on. And he went and finished dealing with the crowd, and then after he met with the crowd, he went up into the mountains to pray. And he went and seek the Lord. And then after that, he came back down to the shores, and he realized that the disciples were out in the midst of the sea, and, and it was kind of rough out there. He knew they were having some difficult times and problems. They couldn't even come in because of the storm. So he just walked out on the water. And when they saw him, they thought maybe, maybe he's dead. Maybe somebody finally got him. And that's his ghost. 
and they was all afraid. Because remember, I told you, all the disciples were going on the same level. That's why Jesus didn't take them back there when he raised them little girl. Because he knew they weren't ready for a lot of stuff. So they said, man, he dead. But Peter, bold and strong, he said, if it's you, he knew if it's you, then you can give me power to do the same thing. Bid me to come out to you. And the Lord said, come. And Peter stepped out and walked on the water. Yeah. Peter knew he can't walk on no water. Yeah. He knew this has got to be yes. God Almighty. Oh. To give him such an authority. Mm. See, when you do something you know you can't do, Hallelujah. you know it's got to be of God. Yeah. Yeah. There are things I have done, and I was a blessing to somebody. I knew it was God because I couldn't do it. There have been times I have preached, and it don't happen often, sadly, but I was preaching, and in the midst of preaching, stuff started coming to me, and I was like, and I was preaching at the same time saying, how do I know this? It was like I was a genius all of a sudden. I'm like, I knew the Bible. I'm like, I can quote the scripture. I was at that point. I knew it was anointed. I'm like, oh my goodness. I just wanted to quote scripture. It's like I knew this stuff, and I knew at that moment it wasn't me. Oh, what a feeling. I wish that happened all the time, but it don't. I was pumped up. I was like, oh my goodness. I was like, the Bible said, if you look at the book of John, and you're in your look at it, and it was just coming, coming, coming. And I knew it was God. Amen. And so Peter knew this had to be God giving him this ability to do this thing. Amen. But then Peter looked around and started saying the wind and all this stuff going on. He got afraid. He started singing. The Lord reached down and grabbed him and said, oh, why did you stay have faith? Why did you lose your faith? You know, he said, just trust me. Hey. But how can that be explained away? Well, first of all, only his main crew saw it. Yeah. It was out of the ocean. So they didn't want him to tell the story. So naturally, they never going to believe them. Just like when a mother goes into the courtroom and testifies for her child, they really not going to take her seriously. Because us going to just kill five people, slaughter them, and the mama will say, he's been a good boy all oh, his life. Now he's just a good boy. <laughs> he never did nothing wrong. He wouldn't hurt a fly. I mean, what you going to say? That's what I'm saying about my kid. <laughs> you don't want your kid going to jail for life, especially when you know, be executed. You got to say what you got to say to save your child's life. So they felt like maybe Jesus ain't walking in the water. The only person said he walked in the water was people that walked with him. Everybody else ain't saw it. So they couldn't explain it away. But then on another occasion, when Jesus was on the boat with them, then a storm came up. And it got rough. But Jesus was tired from all the stuff. Because remember, he was still a man. And he was sleeping. And while he was sleeping, the storm came up. And when the storm came up, amen, the wind got up and the waves got up. And it was bad. And they was throwing water on the boat, you know, throwing water on the boat. See, a boat was floating as long as it ain't got a lot of water in it. Like, like, water, get enough water inside the boat, the boat going down. And they was throwing water out, the water come back in. They throwing water out, the water come back in. And so they went and woke Jesus up. And man, how the world did you sleep and do all of this? Did you even care about what's going on? And he got up. He said, oh, ye of little faith. I mean, all this y'all trying to open the blind eyes and heal the sick, got to cast out devils. Man, people was, uh, couldn't hear, they couldn't walk, and all this stuff that happened, man. I raised up a little girl, man, and a lot of came out the tomb. Man, y'all sitting here scared. Do y'all not know who you will? So he reached up and said, Peace be still. Amen. And then the storm ceased. Now, in the days and times we live in now, I can look on my, my phone and I have an app. And it, tells, and it shows me a Doppler radar, and it tells me where the storm is at. And it tells me when the storm is coming, when the storm may end. Okay, we got that technology now. They didn't have that back then. Yeah. Wasn't no cell phone, wasn't no Doppler radar, wasn't no technology. So how would Jesus know exactly when the storm is going to stop? He didn't know when it was going to stop. He stopped it. Amen. Mm -hmm. He said, peace be still, and immediately it came calm. Mm. Now, some will try to explain it, but I don't know how you're going to explain that one away. Because man still don't have control over the weather. If they did, they would use it in war. That's right. We have tornadoes and hurricanes all the time, and man cannot stop it. The only thing they can say is where it's at, where it's going, and what it's going might do. Mm -hmm. But they cannot control it. Nope. They cannot handle it. Even with nuclear bombs, you can't handle it. Mm. You cannot take a nuclear bomb and control the storm. That goes to show you God is still all power. Oh, man cannot. Stand up against God. 
Amen. Now we're going to get down to the final one. And the final one, of course, is the resurrection. The resurrection. We see here that Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And while he was there, he began to pray. And guess what happened? It was at that point that he realized his hour had came. Yeah. All through the scriptures, it was all about my time has not come. But now his finally came. That that you have given me to do, now it's time for me to do it. Yeah. It's time for me to let the world know who I am. Yeah. Amen. And he goes, and the first thing they do, uh, they come and they take him by force out of the garden. And they take him to Annas first. Now Annas was, wasn't even the high priest. He used to be the high priest, but when the Romans came in, they took the authority away from him. But he still, in his mind, thought he was the high priest. And he was acting like he was the high priest. It was sort of like a, a, a pastor who wasn't a pastor anymore, but still in his mind that he was a pastor. And so, therefore, he was trying to uh, do things as the priest would do. Mm -hmm. Amen. And while they had Jesus, they were mistreating him. He, he was, Jesus asked a question, they were punching him, slapping him. Amen. But then Adam realized he can't do anything anyway, so he sent him to the real priest, which was Caiaphas. And Caiaphas was his uh, son-in-law, and he really wasn't a priest really either. The Romans made him a priest. Mm -hmm. Amen. So they took it to him, and Caiaphas couldn't do anything with it. So Caiaphas sent him to Pilate. Pilate examined him and couldn't find no fault in the man. Pilate asked him questions and everything, but couldn't find nothing wrong. Nothing. But when Pilate found out where he was from, whatever he was from, he sent him to King Herod. Mm. He sent him to King Herod. When he gets to King Herod, King Herod and his men play games with Jesus. They are the ones that put the purple robe on him, put the thorns on his head, and then blindfold him and hit him and punch him and slap him and say, Who hit you? Can you imagine doing that with the Lord? Mm -hmm. I hope these boys got saved because I would hate to die and then wake up and see the Lord and realize that's the one I smacked. Mm -hmm. But in any case, we see here that even Herod couldn't do anything with him. So Herod sent him back to Pilate. Pilate goes back and Pilate's going to let the man free. But Pilate realized that if he let him free, that he's going to lose his authority, his position where he's on. So he was worrying about himself more than he was about the truth. Yeah. So he decided that I'll satisfy the people and have him scorned. And they had Jesus scorned for 39 lashes. And let me tell you about these 39 lashes. Number one, the average person never survived these lashes. Amen. Amen. You could do about five of them and, and, and that would hurt you. Ten, you barely make it. Fifteen, it's hard to believe you're still around. Twenty, you're just pretty much on the mercy of God. Jesus just about doubled that. At that point, they beat him and beat him. Now, if you've seen the Pastor Christ, I think Mel Gibson kind of overdone it. Amen. But at the same time, the Bible did say that Jesus was unrecognized as a man. So it was bad. Amen. It was hard to tell he was even a man. They beat him so bad. Mm -hmm. But in any case, he was bleeding and lost much of his blood. Normally, he should have already been gone. Amen. And most people didn't survive those lashes. And then even after that, you think the people would be satisfied, but they were still crying out, you know, crucify him. We ain't had enough. Crucify him. So then they put him on the cross. They put him on the cross. They nailed his hands to him and his feet, amen, to the cross. Now, they didn't put what you call, you know, we, they say put nails in his hand. Now, don't let that word nail uh, confuse you, because when you think of a nail, I think one of those skinny nails that you use is put in wood. Amen. Those nails are not going to hold nobody on the cross. They were more like spikes. Big nails. They call them nails. And then some, some people say they go in the hand, some say the wrist. I don't know, but in any case, they nailed him to the cross. They took his feet, folded him over, and nailed it to the cross. Then he's up there on the cross. He's already lost a lot of blood from being beat. Then he's on the cross. He's losing blood from the nails in his hands and his feet. And he's up on the cross. They put him up there about 9 o'clock in the morning. Mm. Amen. The Bible said it took about 3 o'clock in the evening before he finally passed out and died. From nine in the morning, that's about six hours. That's a long time hanging on the cross and going through all that. I mean, that's, that, that's a slow death. And it was all because of you. And he's on the cross and he's bleeding and he's going through. And while he's up there, bleeding and going through, they're still marking him, still saying things to him. And then when it was finally finished, he said that it's finished. And then he hung his head and he died. Now, because it was a Passover at the time, they had to hurt get these men off the cross because time was running out. So they goes up, 
to make, they gotta kill these men real fast to get this over with. So when they get to the first two men, there's two other men there. They get to the first two men, they realize they, they still alive, so they break their legs. Boom! Breaking the legs means it makes them hold down and then the blood makes it worse and then they die quick. So after they broke their legs, probably within 30 minutes they were gone. They get ready to break Jesus' legs. But the Bible already said they're not even gonna break a bone in his body. They get ready to break his leg, but oh, we don't need to break his leg, he's already gone. So they don't even break his leg because he's already gone. But to make sure that he is gone, they take a spear and stick it in his side. Now everybody that knows anything about anything about medical, you know that it's two ch the chamber, you got chambers go in the heart, chamber comes out of the heart. So the blood goes through the heart, comes back out of the heart, comes back, go back through the heart. It's the circulation that goes through. Amen. When all the blood goes through the heart and there's no more blood going through the heart, the final thing that goes through the heart is water. Mm -hmm. So when they stuck the spirit inside and went through his heart and blood and water came out, when the water came out, the water indicated that the heart is stopped, it's gone, it's done. He was really, truly dead. He was not unconscious. He was not semi just out of it. He was dead. And that guy self proved it. And then they put him in a bar tomb. Number one, who borrows a tomb? Ain't a tomb for, for life, forever? Amen. Hey man, are you going to borrow something that you need forever? Because Jesus knew he wasn't going to need it. It was a borrowed tomb. They stuck him in there. They sealed it up again, even if he was alive. Being in the tomb would have suffocated him and he killed him. And he was in there three days. And then he came out of the grave. Now, with that miracle, there is no way possible, no man or nobody can explain that one away. Number one, who's around to raise him up? He rose himself up. The God that we serve not only had the power to give power, but he had power to raise himself up all day. First of all, God himself really cannot never die. God can never cease to be, to be gone. He has always been gone. But you talk about the man side of God. That is a miracle out of all the miracles that was done that cannot be talked away, explained away by nobody. Out of everybody that has every religion, and I am definitely about to close, out of every religion that you've heard of, that people then believe in all kinds of stuff, the God that I've served have a record that cannot be explained away. He is truly, really God Almighty. He is the one that we should serve. There's no other way you can go to heaven but by him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No way come to the Father but by him. When he rose up, he said, all power has been given to me in heaven and in earth. He had a glorified body. And let me tell you this, even though that little girl was raised up, even though Lazarus was raised up, even though people from the Old Testament was raised up, this was the first person who was raised up to die no more. You see, yeah. great lives when the rest of them, they rose up, but eventually they died. Yeah. Jesus rose to die no more. Yeah. But then he rose others up during that time. Yeah. But he was yeah. the first. The very first. Oh. And I got news for you if you don't already know. Yeah. You are too going to yeah. raise up one day. Yeah. If you leave and die now, yes, one day yeah. he's going to raise you up the same way he did you. Yeah. To die no more. How many times was he with? Come on, 
By his stripes we are healed. Yeah. Yeah. See, his stripes were the healing for everything that you can get. I don't care if it's cancer, we don't matter what it is. He's already been beat for it. He always has given us the victory over it. Yes. Amen. So I want to say this in my clothes. Amen. You can explain away a lot of things. Come on. Amen. His hour finally came. Come on. Amen. He told the world who he was. And he now sits at the right hand of the Father. Yes, he does. Amen. Amen. And when he Amen. ascended back into the heavens, Hallelujah. all the disciples and all stood there and looked at him. Yes. And the angel looked at them and said, This same Jesus. Same. They didn't say another Jesus or a Jesus that looks like him. Or Jesus is similar to him. He said, this same Jesus shall return in like now. Just as you have seen him go, he shall return. Amen. Amen. He's coming back. Amen. Amen. And that's what this is all about. Amen. Amen. Enjoy life while you're here. Have some fun. Go out. Hey. Be with your family. Amen. I, I, don't just be all holy. Holy, but just enjoy life to some degree. Enjoy your babies, your grandchildren, your, your children, your family, your, your life. Do something for yourself. See something sometime. Amen. But most importantly, don't forget who you are. Amen. Don't forget who you are. Because you're going to return. I want to, and as some of the old saints say all the time, I want to go on and see what the end. Go on and see what the end. Route. And y'all were used to the short route. 
But it's good to have the, the city around here now and then. Yeah. But like when, when I go to the mountain, like when go 21, if I come back across and pick up 40. Boy, it's faster, but the city ground is 421, so you can always take a different route. But ain't but one route to get to heaven. And that's through his name. Amen? Mark 16, 16, 16, 16, 16. In his name. What is his name, Clay? Jesus. You know, I, I see a lot of educated people. They say Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Those are not names. Yeah. Yeah, that's not a name. I'm a son. I'm a father. I have a whole bunch of people to be seen. The me and the father are one. I'm in the father. The word is used, it, it came from the Greek word father. But the word the Jews use was Messiah. We use father and he they use Messiah. That's why they use Messiah, because they know who you are. And people use the father, don't know who he is. Jews never use the word father. They always say Messiah. Because, and they don't use Adonai and all those words black folks use, all sons of geese. They don't use those words. They don't even believe in Jesus Christ. They kill him. They don't believe in Jesus. They rejected him. Read the Bible. Who do you think man is killed? Mm -hmm. That's a priest. Did he kill him? He had him killed. He looked, you read all the dirty ones. But Jesus said, everybody got to come back to him. The Jews got to come back to Christ. Oh, yeah. They got to come back. Mm -hmm. All those who left the Lord got to come back. Because mm -hmm. he is the true Messiah. Yeah. David knew who he was. Mm -hmm. David knew who he was, mm -hmm. not even in hell. They know who he is. We know who he is, right, Saints? Amen. 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 Yes, yes, yes. And we praise God. Let us all stand. Anybody need special prayer with your little girl? It's still early. Anybody need special prayer? You need to do something in your life. Whatever you need, God is here. Yes, yes. He's here right now. Amen. You know, I, I look at people that go to ball games and sit all day hooping and hollering and go through all quarters, the whole game. They had any homecoming yesterday. Nobody left? Left they lost. But when it comes to church, you're going to hear it. Amen? You're going to hear it. So we praise God. This nobody, they have a need, but it's not coming out of us. They have a need. Everybody has a need. Amen. Amen. This is in the hands of God. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you can do for nobody else. When you're in God's hands, that's the best place to be. When you're in God's hands, Jesus Christ's hands, that's the best place. It is the only safe way. Mm. When we put our children, our grandchildren in his hands, mm. yeah. and say, God, you handle it, I can't handle it. Amen. Amen. Lord, you fix it, I can't fix it. Yeah. Because you will burn yourself to death, yeah. and you end up in a grave, and your child still living. Yeah. But we got 25 of them, Lord, he, they belong to him. Yeah. All of them. Belong to the Lord. And he it is hard for mothers to give up. We're not saying give up, mothers. But put them in Jesus' hands. Yeah. The same we do when they go back and get back to God. And every time they do bad, we give back to the Lord. When they do good, we take it back. And when they do bad, we give it to the Lord. And when they do good, we give it back to the Lord. We, we, we got to decide who we have. Hard decisions, but we gotta make decisions. Lord, you got it, you fix it. And he will fix it. Yes, he will. Brother Vincent is in God's hands. Because he should have been, could have been dead, but he's not. The stuff that happened to that young man, it ain't no way he should be here. But God kept him. Seeing it and whatever. Honestly, you think. You don't see it.